This is Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. Is incremental change better than no change? When you ask that question, on paper at least, the answer seems obvious. Something is generally better than nothing. But we live in a country of single-issue voters and an electorate that's generally more excited by principles than execution. Think of the Bernie Bros of 2016. For a lot of progressives, political purity matters. And it is all or nothing. So is purity practical? Or do we shoot ourselves in the foot by writing off anyone we sort of disagree with? I see politics as a way to advance on the issues that I care about. And if I can't get it all right then, I am going to take what I can get. Shaniqua McClendon of Crooked Media joins Hear Me Out in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. For a presidential election year, a good chunk of the country is remarkably unconcerned when it comes to electability. The Republican primary is, for all intents and purposes, uncontested. And exit poll after exit poll makes it clear that Trump voters don't care so much about electability or the ability to beat Joe Biden, at least not as much as they care about values what their candidate stands for, or at least claims to stand for, and whether it aligns with what they care about. And really, this is a more common phenomenon on the left. The progressive movement leans toward uncompromising progress. Just look at the increasingly loud liberal voters who are abandoning Joe Biden solely because of his handling of the war in Gaza, or the people who would only accept all student loans forgiven or nothing at all. We talked recently on this show about horse race journalism. And a big part of that discussion was about the kind of coverage voters really want to see or hear, issues, or who's going to win. So if, in fact, a good chunk of the electorate is voting on values, what does that mean? What does it mean about those voters? Our guest today argues that this ideological purity complex is a product of privilege, and it might be undermining the whole reason we elect politicians to begin with. That guest is Shaniqua McClendon, Vice President of Politics for Crooked Media. Hi there, Shaniqua. Hi. Thank you for having me. Um, first, for those who don't know Crooked Media, what is that? Ah, so Crooked Media is uh, what we call a progressive media company. I used to just call it um, a progressive podcast company, but now I call <laughs> it a progressive media company. A big part of what we do is similar to news organizations. We put information out there. We educate people about what's going on in politics. The difference is we also we don't want to just tell people what's wrong. We want to tell them what they can do to fix the things that they care about. And that is actually why I got hired. Um, I run our political department and how I describe it is we pull people in through the continent and then we push them over to Vote Save America so that they can uh, tap in and, and and do something. And we I mean, Vote Save America feels like my little baby. It'll be six this year. And um, it's it's been tremendous. We've uh, in five and a half years, raised $55 million for progressive organizations and candidates and uh, have mobilized over 600,000 voters, volunteers, and donors. So it's it's, it's just been amazing. The last thing I'll say, um, you know, it's just been great that we've told our audience, if you care about something and you get involved, you can have an impact. And, you know, it keeps happening. So we're going to help you keep it. I mean, I'm all for reducing cynicism about government and about politics. It's so hard. if you guys are achieving that, yeah, it's it's not easy. But if you guys are achieving that in some way, I'm all for it. <laughs> um, the opinion that you're bringing us to us today, though, is about ideological purity. And, and I'll let you um, give us sort of the elevator, the brief summary of what this opinion is, what your your view of this is. I mean, I think a lot of people know what moral purity is. But tell us about ideological purity in politics. Yeah, the way the way I kind of define it is a belief that if our elected leaders don't always uphold the ideologically purest version of a policy position, then they are not actually committed to the values they say they stand for. And so I think a perfect example uh, is the Democratic primary in 2020, um, where healthcare was a really big part of the conversation. But what it seemed like to me was if you were not not supportive of Medicare for all, but maybe if you did not think it was feasible in our current political climate, that you did not care about people having access to health care, which 
I just don't think it's true of any of the Democratic candidates who who were running. I think all of them wanted people to have access to health care. And yeah, you can't always just make things happen because you want to will them into existence. Okay, so give us an example, because I'll I'll tell you what, when you're talking about ideological purity, I actually don't think about conservatives. Um, The reason is, is because often in recent years, at least, well, recent, in the past half century, (laughs) many (laughs) many conservative voters have put all of their emphasis on one thing. It's often abortion in the past 50 years, and they will put up with anything else. If as long as that candidate agrees with them on abortion, that's not ideological purity, is it? No, no, because they put up with a lot. You know, honestly, the way the, the reason I get so frustrated when people are like, no, this is where you have to be on all these things or it's the only way um, I'm going to support you is you sacrifice a lot of progress when you do that. Now, we should, of course, have parameters around what we're willing to accept and what we're not willing to accept. I think on abortion, conservatives have been willing to accept a whole lot. Um, a I mean, lot. You see, grab, I mean, grab her by the pussy yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Try to overthrow the government a lot. Um, and, you know, a yeah. lot of them are still just like, well, you know, we, we were able to get Roe overturned. But it worked. The, yeah. Yeah, it did. Exactly. And so now I wouldn't sacrifice that much. But the way I look at it is you have your beliefs. I think people should absolutely believe things. They should feel, you know, if they feel strongly about it, have those convictions. But when I think about politics, I'm thinking about progress and I see politics as a way to advance on the issues that I care about. And if I can't get it all right, then I am going to take what I can get. I know people do not like to hear about uh, incrementalism. I know that's like a dirty word, but people benefit in the increments. There are a lot of people, and this is where what gets to the privilege piece. Going back to abortion, we saw limited bans on, you know, 15 week ban down a 16 week ban. They were willing to take the steps to get closer and closer, which they're not fully there yet. Hopefully we will not get there, but they are willing to do 20 week, 15 week, five week and then no abortions at all. And then, you know, no abortion pills, no contraception. They are willing to take those increments. And I'm sure that no IVF. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that, you know, looking at it now, there are a lot of Democrats, myself included, who are really angry that we are where we are. But they were willing to take those small steps to get where we are. And now they're happy. And if we were willing to do that, I think we could see more progress on other things. But we get caught up in these fights about not being in the perfect position, even though being in the perfect position means nothing if you have to put it through a Congress that has a bunch of Republicans. Yeah. So when we talk about, just to be clear, when we talk about ideological purity, especially in this cycle, in the 2024 mm-hmm. presidential election, most people are talking about the Democrats. Now, I'm an independent, mm-hmm. um, but most people are, are, when they say this, they're talking about the purity test of, of Democrats. So, I mean, that immediately brings to mind like a, a Bernie bro, right? Um, somebody who refused to vote for Hillary Clinton because they wanted Bernie Sanders instead. Is that what you mean? Yeah, it's both. It's like the Bernie question is layered for me because I I spent six years working on Capitol Hill, um, very much understand how the sausage is made. And he had a lot of great ideas. But the feasibility of a lot of his ideas actually becoming law, very low. And so Specifically, with- also, if I could throw in something yeah. here, he has a long history in the Senate, which is one of the most yeah. powerful seats in all of government and never got anything done. Exactly. So, so, again, as a journalist, I had a lot of reservations about whether he would be able to accomplish any of that. Exactly. But go- continue. Yeah, no, but that's my point. Um, with purity politics, it's often in theory, it's often academic, and it's where people feel uh. good. And it's all about just you know, demonstrating to the world, this is where I stand. This is the purest position for me to be. But then we're never going to get there if the only thing you will take is that thing. Because similar to abortion, there was not, <laughs> there was never going to be a time where Roe, the Roe decision came down and then we were immediately going to just go to the overturning of Roe. It was popular. Yeah. So people, they had to eat away at it. And that's a negative framing of it. But even as we think about progress, you know, maybe instead of eating away at it, we have to inch toward it. But going back to Bernie Sanders, and I don't blame him 
No, no, no. Actually, I think politicians should be honest. I kind about, of blame him. Yeah, yeah, they should be honest about the way that they plan to get things done. Um, I do think that that yeah. is something that Elizabeth Warren did a good job on. And I, you know, people would say, well, they're the same. Why wouldn't you just like both of them? Process matters. That was the first thing I learned on Capitol Hill. Process matters, and it's a political tool to get things done. And someone who's been in the Senate as long as him should know how to maneuver to to get some of those things done. But it also, I think, pulled in a lot of people who don't have a full understanding of how our government works into thinking that you yeah. could just, I don't know, the president can just do whatever they want and they can sign any bills into law and we just get whatever we want, even if, you know, half of the Congress. And honestly, with a lot of the stuff Bernie Sanders wanted, most of the Congress did not agree with. So how are these things ever going to actually become law? So but here's the thing, to a certain extent, it makes sense to me that you'd be saying this. You, you're you a black woman. Mm-hmm. I'm a black woman. Mm-hmm. Going back through the history of America, black women have always yeah. endorsed incrementalism. Yeah. <laughs> they've, oh, they've been very practical about voting for candidates that they 49% didn't agree with because they wanted, they were a, at least a step in the right direction. That mm-hmm. has been true of African-American women in particular yeah. for a very, very long time, well before they had uh, suffrage. On the other hand, mm-hmm. this this label of purity politics has also been put on reformers and those who are pushing for progression yeah. um, in a negative way. Like that has been used to prevent progress, this label of purity. When I'm talking about purity politics, I am speaking more in like an electoral sense. I do think Mm -hmm. that we need people pushing from the outside because the only reason, for instance, Joe Biden had passed some of the progressive policies that he's passed is because there were people who said, this is what we need. Specifically thinking about student loans. I think student loans is something Joe Biden did not want to do at all. I don't think he believed that it was something that should happen and that people should pay off their loans because they took them out. And, you know, I, I went to Harvard for grad school and I still remember when he said, if you went to an Ivy League school, you should not get your loans uh, forgiven. I grew up poor. I still have like, six figures and loans from Harvard. So it's hard for me. It's allowed me to have this great job that I love. But the people who don't have loans were rich already. And so I think he yeah. has like a fundamental misunderstanding of how any of this works. But he was pushed because you had um, activists, you had people in the Senate like Senator Warren pushing for this. Obviously, the Supreme Court struck down the forgiveness. But Yes. But that aside for a second, we had some people saying, forgive every, all the debt that people have. No one should yes. have debt for going to college. Then I'm sure there are people in between there and 50,000. But then we get to 50,000 and then we get to 10,000. And we, you know, I, I think what the activists did was push him to have a conversation about what amount is feasible. Um, I think now seeing where it ended up, 50,000 is he probably didn't feel comfortable doing that because they struck down the 10,000 and forgiving all of it that would have been unpopular just generally. Um, But once we get to the point where we're having a conversation about forgiving student loans, at that point, if people would have said, no, it's all or nothing, we would have gotten nothing. And so now we get to a point where, no, it wasn't everything. No, it wasn't 50,000. Is 10,000 great for my six-figure loans? No, (laughs) but it is something. And it's 10,000 more dollars that I don't have to pay that doesn't have uh, compounded daily interest on it. Um, and so again, that's incremental, but it is a value. I know I'm in the minority with six figures in student loans. There's a lot of people who $10,000 would wipe out their student loan debt and it would be half of it. It would be significant for them. And so in what world would I say all or nothing when people will actually be helped in the process? And so I do think it's important to have people pushing the conversation as far as we can get it. And the fact that they are having conversations about forgiving all of people's student debt gets us there. But when it's actually time to pass a policy, I don't think that's the point at which you uh, say no. All or nothing. We have to take a break. But when we come back, I'm going to ask about the times that this has gone wrong, horribly wrong in electoral politics. Uh, uh, we're We're talking about the purity test of politics. And we'll talk more after a break. This is Hear Me Out. Stay with us.
Eating better is so easy with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is crafted by chefs, approved by dietitians, and ready to go in just two minutes. You'll have more than 35 different options to choose from every week, including Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. And there are more than 60 add-ons that help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day long and customize your meals. So what are you waiting for? You can get started today and get after your goals. I'm going to be eating some Factor meals, and I honestly, I looked at the meal and cannot wait. Every single meal looks so good, it's hard to choose. Like they have a jalapeno lime cheddar chicken, which sounds fantastic. They have a shredded chicken taco bowl that comes with cilantro lime sour cream. I mean, there's a cheesy chicken and broccoli with brown jasmine rice. Seriously, every single meal here looks delicious. The trouble is deciding which one to get. You can get, by the way, as much as you want or as little as you want. You just choose your own meals every week. Plus, you can pause or reschedule your deliveries if you're gonna be out of town or for whatever reason. Factor meals are ready to heat and eat. There is no prep, no cooking, and no cleanup needed. Factor is the perfect solution if you want fast, premium restaurant quality meals. Sign up and save. Also, Factor is less expensive than takeout and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. Head to factormeals.com slash hearmeout50 and use code hearmeout50 to get 50% off. That's code hearmeout50 at factormeals.com slash hearmeout50 to get 50% off. With what seems like an endless amount of information at our fingertips, we tend to forget that wondering about things is really part of the journey to finding answers we're looking for. So when it comes to the hot topics of Israel, Judaism, and Zionism, there's so much to wonder about right now that it's hard to know where to turn. Enter the latest weekly podcast from Unpacked, Wondering Jews with Michal and Noam. Join hosts and educator extraordinaires Michal Biton and Noam Weissman as they tackle these topics and the uncomfortable questions that surround them with the goal of working towards the answers, together with their listeners. No matter where you're from, if you've ever wondered about anything, this is the podcast for you. So check it out. Subscribe to Wondering Jews with Michal and Noam on your favorite podcast app today. Wondering Jews is brought to you by Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. Welcome back. This is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate. I'm Celeste Headley. And with me today from Crooked Media is Shaniqua McClendon, who says that ideological purity is harming progressivism. So I just want to point out there have been times in electoral politics where, you know, look, I'm black and Jewish, where my people have um, voted for someone who at least matched some of the criteria they wanted mm-hmm. and then ended up being absolutely horrible. We talked with David Frum about Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson said some of the right things. And in comparison with others, right, He, we thought, my ancestors thought, he was the lesser of a couple evils. Would it have been different if they insisted on a more extreme um, test? Of, of friendliness? I don't know. They ended up getting a, a rampant racist in the White House. Okay. I don't think lesser of two evils and uh, getting all the progress you can get are the same things. Okay. I'm going to use some numbers just because that helps me like okay. kind of contextualizing. If you... <laughs> Content warning. <laughs> she's going to use numbers. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> if you... Lesser of two evils could mean you get like, you go from zero to negative two or negative three with your two choices. That is not forward moving at all. But if you have two people and one of them takes you to one and the other one takes you to three, but your goal is 10, I want the person who's going to take me to three. I don't want to go backwards at all. So someone taking me to negative one or negative two, that's the same to me because I'm losing something in that. But going the other way, I'm getting something. And so I want progress to be part of it. So if we, and you know, I don't personally think I've ever voted in an election where I was actually voting for the lesser of two evils. I do believe that I've voted for in elections where I wasn't particularly super happy about both candidates, but I did feel like one would advance the things that were important to me. Okay, so I'm thinking about uh, Barack Obama's first 
year or two in office mm -hmm. when he was trying to get the Affordable Health Care Act passed. Yeah. And a landmark piece of legislation. Absolutely. Yeah. But it does represent a lot of compromises. Yes. Yeah. And it represents a lot of compromises at a time when the Democrats controlled all of Congress. Yes. Um, isn't there an argument to be made that he should have insisted upon a little bit more of a purity that he shouldn't have made all those compromises? I think people forget we had like true moderate, like somewhat conservative Democrats in Congress at that time. Like they were the problem. I mean, we we literally had all the, this huge majority and still couldn't get these things done and there were Democrats standing in the way. And so that sucks. I mean, you know, it's the same thing we saw with Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. Like sometimes you just have people who are in the party who are not helpful. Um, and so then again, I, I actually think this underscores my point. You get what you can. You know, I, I actually started working on the Hill in August of 2010 and I was interning at the White House when the Affordable Care Act got passed. And you know, I, I think implementation was probably seemed it was everyone chaotic. was mad. Yes, it was. It felt yeah. more chaotic than the actual bill um, being passed. But seeing that process happen and seeing how frustrated people got, um, and I worked in, the, I was interning in the office of presidential correspondent, so people were writing in and they were like pissed off. I mean, on both sides, but it's still more than what we had before. And especially because you think of how many iterations there have been of someone trying to pass universal health care in the United States. He actually got something passed. The Congress actually got something passed. And, you know, this is, sorry, I was about to say shame on the Democrats who like water down the bill. Um, but we can't do anything about that. These people were truly moderates. They felt like they were representing their their constituents. Uh, and I mean, politics was involved, too, but I still think the yeah. country's better off for it. And racism was involved, let's be honest. Well, yeah. Be yeah. But, but would we have Joe Biden as president if um, we weren't overly concerned about electability? Like, would we have Hillary Clinton have been the be the candidate if and again, I'm an independent, but Democrats are. Um, are often very concerned with elect electability. And we've mentioned several times that conservatives are sort of like one issue voters mm -hmm. um, and not concerned about electability. But, the, you know, one of the reasons Joe Biden ended up being the um, candidate as opposed to Elizabeth Warren or Mayor Pete or whomever is because people got so worried that none of the other candidates would be electable that they preemptively, <laughs> you know, ratcheted I think down. That, I think that could be the case for some, maybe a lot of people. I think that is definitely, and I'm not one to say the media is dictating what we think. I, I do think that is part <laughs> of, you know, a media narrative. But also I think there are people who actually believe that and voted believing that other people would be thinking that when they went into the voting booth. But I also, I, I was talking to a friend about this the other day. Everyone I know voted for Elizabeth Warren. She did not make it very far, which says a lot about the bubble that I'm in. And so I do think elect people's feelings about electability is a part of it. But I also think a lot of the country actually liked Joe Biden. My grandmother loves Joe Biden. Like a lot of the older black people I know love Joe Biden. He won the primary. He was also Barack Obama's um, vice president. So people knew him. And so it's hard for me to like, I think all of that goes into it. And obviously, you know, name this name recognition is part of being electable. Um, but I, I guess I don't, I don't. Yeah. 2020 was such a specific <laughs> instance because Donald Trump was like, everyone was scared, but I, I yeah, think everyone was scared. But also look, Shaniqua, when you talk about electability, anytime that you bring up electability or likability, women suffer. Candidates of, yes, of color yes, suffer. Yes, I agree. I completely agree. Because the agree. most electable candidates is a white are guy. white guys over six feet tall. That is the most electable candidate in the United States. Yeah. That's something I struggle with a lot because it is the truth. But this country is racist and sexist. And so, you know, how do you force? I can't even believe these words are coming out of my mouth. Like, but how do you get a country that's racist and uh, sexist to support someone who's not a white man? And, you know, what I always think is so interesting is the 2008 primary, because I was just like, wow, there's a white woman and a black man. 
let's see who's going to win this battle. And the man still won. I mean, now I did vote for Barack Obama. I also but... did not. I did not think Barack Obama was going to. Me either. I, had, I really did not think. That was my first presidential election I got to vote in. And I went into th- that booth and said, he's going to lose, but he'll have my vote. And I was in North Carolina and he won the state. Both, you know, obviously the primary and the and the general. But again, when we when we're talking about um, electability, um, when we talk about not using a purity test, that made the Republicans end up with Donald Trump, right? And many Republicans think that was an absolute disaster. It could very well be. We still don't know at this point, but Donald Trump's election could be sort of the dissolution of the Republican Party. We still don't know if the Republican yeah. Party will survive this. I know. I mean, yeah, I, I'd say they also, you know, I obviously there's factions of, of the uh, Republican Party, but you know, I think taxes are the other part. Uh, I think there's a lot of rich Republicans who actually don't care about abortion. They probably want it to still yeah. be intact, but maybe they're just, uh, it's funny. <laughs> Going back to the privilege part of this, I think there's some selfishness and individuality, individualism um, on the Republican side. And I, I do think there's more collectivism on the Democratic side. But going back to the privilege piece, like a lot of what I hear when I hear people who are kind of engaging in purity politics is, well, I'm speaking up for those whose voices are not heard and like all of this. And I guarantee you, if you spoke to someone whose voice was not heard and they had to choose between getting um, the affordable, the yeah, the Affordable Care Act or, you know, a version of that with universal health care, they take whichever one they could get. And that's that's why the, I feel like this is such a privileged thing to kind of stand in, because when you don't benefit from the incremental change, it means you have a lot. And you, and who are you to demand oh, that, that we get everything or nothing and not acknowledge the people who are sacrificed in that time? Going back to the Affordable Care Act, who stayed alive because we had the Affordable Care Act and didn't say it's all or nothing? There's a lot of people who are literally probably still alive in that. And that's, you know, I, I think people should have conviction about the things that they believe in. But I just know that there are people who look like me who get sacrificed in these conversations of all or nothing. OK, we have to take another break, but um, I feel like we've gotten to a really interesting point. So I'm anxious to come back. Stay with us. This is Hear Me Out. The history of HIV and AIDS is the history of people who were told to stay out of sight and who refused to do so. Gay men, but also injection drug users, women and, yes, children who contracted the virus. Join host Kai Wright for Blind Spot, The Plague in the Shadows, a new series that seeks to answer the question of how much pain could have been avoided had we paid attention sooner. From the History Channel and WNYC Studios, Blind Spot, The Plague in the Shadows. Listen wherever you get podcasts. At a time when information continues to come at us faster and faster, sometimes you need to hit pause and rewind. NPR's Throughline takes you back in time to the source of the news stories filling your feed. Find NPR's Throughline wherever you get your podcasts. We're back. It's Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate. And we're talking about ideological purity when it comes to electing a presidential candidate. To a certain extent, um, I feel like, like, let's go back to, say, the Civil War. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican, but he was an incremental change, right? Like, Mm -hmm. he had no desire to end slavery when he became president. Yeah. Um, So I feel like his election supports your argument. Um, he didn't, pa- for a, for abolitionists, he did not pass the purity test. And yet they still ended up getting what they wanted. On the other hand, prior to his election, you had all kinds of people calling the abolitionists crazy and fanaticists and um, neurotic because they insisted that nothing short of abolition was enough. And and I, I wonder if because 
if that counts for you, because they weren't talking about presidential candidates per se. I mean, maybe they fit more in line with the Republicans, recent Republicans, in that they took that one issue and just stuck with it over time. Okay. So I see the abolitionists the way I describe the activists pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. I see. But if if when Abraham Lincoln said, this is what I can do, they said, that's not enough. Like, who are they to say about the lives of enslaved people You can't get anything because it's not enough for us. I don't like purity politics, but the real core of this are the people who engage in it. So give me an example. Give me an example of how that's working right now. Like what? Obviously, you have seen some political discourse leading up to this election. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind to me is that those who are not who say they won't vote for Joe Biden because of how he's handling the war in Gaza. Does that count? I want to like be sensitive here. I I don't think that being upset with a politician on what they're doing um, is purity politics. Like people used to get mad at me because I criticized Barack Obama all the time. Um, There's and, plenty to criticize. Yeah, I yeah. just, you know, um, and, and I think we should be able to criticize our leaders. Gaza is obviously like, it's bad. I think Joe Biden needs to, I mean, obviously call for a permanent ceasefire, but literally like we have we can put strings on the money that we're giving to, to Israel. We don't have to allow them to do whatever they want. But this is an interesting one because I'm thinking now about Ukraine and Russia and Israel and Gaza. And I was talking to a friend about this last night and we were talking about like what would on us on the progressive side, what would a progressive foreign policy, you know, look like national security policy look like? Because in my head, unless I'm wrong, Diplomacy would be the only way to handle things if we had like a very pure, progressive um, uh, national security agenda. But you think about someone like uh, Vladimir Putin. I don't think there's any form of diplomacy that he would respond to. I mean, the sanctions aren't. And diplomacy work- wouldn't have wouldn't have prevented the Hamas terrorist attack on the music festival. No, no, it wouldn't. No, it wouldn't have. But. So, sorry. So on the Ukraine side, I don't think there's any form of diplomacy that would stop Putin. I agree. I agree that diplomacy won't work on on Hamas. But that doesn't mean that it won't work on Netanyahu. And Mm. 30,000 people being dead, there's got to be another way. And I'm not an expert on the Middle East. I recognize that most people are advocating for a two-state solution. And I recognize that there are people in Israel who feel like they will not be safe under a two-state solution. But there are also Palestinians who don't feel safe right now. Um, And I mean, they're being bombed. 30,000 people people have died. And so I agree with you that um, diplomacy would not have stopped the October 7th attack. Um, And I don't think diplomacy works on terrorists. With that said, Joe Biden does have some some strings he can pull with Netanyahu so that he will figure out something that he can do that is better than this. And again, I'm not an expert here, but back to the purity politics uh, piece. I don't think that calling Joe Biden out for that is bad. I think we should. I don't think it's purity politics to want him to do better. Um, I think all of our presidents... What if you don't vote for him because of it? So that is where I get back to what I was saying earlier about moving okay. forward versus moving back. And as bad as I think things are, I do not believe that Donald Trump is going to put Palestinians in a better place. That's just like point blank period. You know, there was coverage of um, Israeli political leaders saying that if Trump was just in office, they wouldn't have to deal with all this resistance. And it's not that much resistance from us. And they're, you know, referring to it like it's a lot. Now, that does not bring comfort to the people who have lost loved ones. I know that. And politics is not always a space where you can make people feel warm and fuzzy. And maybe I've worked in politics too long and lost the warm and fuzzies part. But one candidate's going to do this, the other's going to do that. Now, I will say, Shaniqua, right before, you know, we only have a, about a minute left, but um, we have plenty of listeners who support Donald Trump, who are Republicans. Mm-hmm. Um, is this issue that you're talking about, is it only a, a progressive issue? 
I mean, you're uh, talking about incrementalism um, being better for progress than purity. Is that solely a message for Democrats? Well, uh, my familiarity in working in politics is that Republicans are typically trying to keep the status quo or take us back to a time where white people, men had all the power. And so I just don't see what they're fighting for as moving forward. And if I can't see it as moving forward, then progress isn't part of it. I know a lot of you have thoughts on this. I I would really be interested in hearing from people on the right who have been maybe single issue voters in the past. Maybe you have put up with a lot of things you don't like in a candidate because they align with you on your most important value. Or maybe people on the left. You know, I'd love to hear from a Bernie bro. Give me the argument for why a purity test is worthwhile. Love to hear that. Whatever your thoughts are, I know you're having them and I want to hear them. A couple weeks ago, we discussed horse race journalism with Chris Siliza. We got some great comment on that show. So before we go, here's one of them. A listener named Tito wrote this. You and Chris did a fantastic job describing how matters are covered by journalists proceeding during and beyond the campaign period. I lean on the side that journalism is the root of the degradation of modern day electioneering. That's rough, Tito. And the lack of objectivity of how hot topic issues are covered. For instance, the issue of the border, which peaks at election time. This issue has been weaponized due to journalists reporting on it and contributing to grossly misleading and misinforming the public by playing to emotion, then facts. First of all, thank you, Tito. Rough, but fair. Um, I will say that I'm not sure the issue in my opinion, was weaponized by journalists. I think that it comes up during election time because politicians find it very easy to stoke people's fears by talking about foreigners, the others from outside our country and invading. Um, I do think it's fair to say that we don't have to cover that if we don't want to. Um, I think that's absolutely correct. But We love hearing these comments from you. Thank you to everyone who sends in your comments and responses. We read all of them, even if we can't read them over the air. Our email address is hearmeout at slate.com. We know you have thoughts to share, so keep them coming. Hear Me Out is a podcast from Slate. The show is produced by Maura Curry. Ben Richmond is the Senior Director of Podcast Operations. And Alicia Montgomery is the VP of Slate Audio. I am your host, Celeste Headley. Until next time, speak your mind but keep it open.